Age becomes a risk factor for all sorts of things. It becomes a risk factor for you to develop disease. It becomes a risk factor every time you need a treatment. You don't need to have a full-blown disease for senescence or for any kind. You had the opportunity to measure senescence in people. Mm -hmm. And what did you decide then was the first use case for that? Again and again and again, but we're hearing from doctors, oh my God, this is what I need. It's a projection, right? We're mm -hmm. not interested in what will happen in the next 30 days. We want to know how well you're doing in general. We all have vastly different immune systems. And so immune function as in general declines with age, but there is a huge, just like senescence really. But My name is Matt Caberline and welcome to the OptusBan YouTube channel. All right, hey everyone, welcome to the OptusBan podcast. We are taking our show on the road today uh, here at the beautiful Mayflower Hotel in Washington, D.C. Actually, we just got back from the A4LI congressional briefing uh, for the Longevity Caucus, which was pretty interesting. I'm thrilled to be joined by Natalia Mitten, CEO of Sapir Bio, who is also here for the A4LI event. And so we're going to sit down and talk about all things senescence and maybe some rapamycin. So we'll just see where this, this conversation goes. Absolutely. Um, so thank Pl you for, for joining me. Pleasure to be here. All right, so let's start maybe with giving folks uh, a little bit of information about Sapir mm -hmm. and what Sapir does, and then we can dive into the science and a little bit about your background and, and how Absolutely. you got here. So I think the the story of Sapir probably will start with my background. It might be easier. So I was trained as a, chemi as a chemical engineer, and I went to grad school for chemistry, and then I very quickly fell in love with biology, and that kind of started my biology progression. And I worked on um, problems and sort of what we call basic science. So whether it's cancer, how tumors metastasize for a while. And then I, when I, when I accepted a faculty position at UNC, the reason I came to University of North Carolina is because I wanted to, to kind of merge the translational with the basic biology that I could do. Because it's the idea of being able to translate the things I work on was extremely appealing. And so that's why I came to UNC. And so there is sort of, there is, um, and so then I was, a, I was a faculty at UNC for about 10 years. And then so, I- So you came to UNC for your PhD. No, I came, right? so I was, I did PhD in Bowling Green, uh, Ohio. Uh -huh. So I did PhD there. Then I did a postdoc at post Purdue. Then I came to UNC. Got it. And so, but, but that's, so Purdue had a cancer center, but there was no hospital. So you couldn't really do translational research right. at Purdue and UNC had both. And so it was sort of designated cancer center. And, um, and, and sort of this, sort of this, this, this passion and the idea that I wanted a translation and then discovering what that means and actually doing it became a passion of mine. And that's why I, um, that's why I started the company with Ned Sharpless a few years ago that that focuses on this idea of how we take something that was developed in his lab and how do we translate it. Right. So the whole purpose of the company is to take measures, biological measures in blood, and ask the question of how can you use it in the patient population. And so so the story of Sapir Bio sort of is somewhat simple. It's a very simple idea that when um, when patients, you know, as we get older and we become patients or even before we become patients, there is um, age becomes a risk factor for all sorts of things. It becomes a risk factor for you to develop disease. It becomes a risk factor every time you need a treatment and your doctor doesn't quite know because sort of at least in, in this healthcare system, they might not have ever seen you. The surgeon who you get in consult with might not have seen you ever. So they have no idea who you are. They have no idea what your lifestyle is. They don't know what your sort of biological risks are. Yeah. And so then you get treated as a, you know, a person of certain gender and certain age, which may or may not be you. Yeah, right. And it puts you in a lower risk or high risk category. And so we we really, and so that's where we, we when we started thinking about how do you translate it, that's what we started with. You can optimize, you know, all the anesthesia and length of surgery. And you can optimize all these things. And the hospitals are really good at doing that because they have massive amount of data. So they learned how to optimize these things to achieve the best outcomes. What they don't know is who the patient is. Yeah. And that's and so when we started developing products for these sort of indications, we over again and again and again, but we're hearing from doctors, oh my God, this is what I need because I got all this other stuff. If yeah. I know who the patient is, I know exactly what to do. I'm just not going to do it for everybody. And so I think that's sort of the, that idea of being able to apply this to kind of, 
you know, to unveil that risk, to kind of uncover, to show your provider, whatever the provider may be, who you are, is really important. And because currently there is no yeah. other way to do this. Well, and I mean, that's that's the whole, you know, concept of personalized medicine, right? You need Absolutely. tools to be able to assess where each individual is at so that you can give them the personalized treatment or protocol or whatever it is that you're trying to achieve to get them to a better Absolutely. place. Um, so, okay, so let's, let's, let's take a step back and, and kind of get to what specifically Sapir's diagnostics or tools mm -hmm. are doing, right? So yep. you got your start in cancer, mm -hmm. you said, and you, you went to North Carolina. Now, did you work in Ned's lab or were you guys collaborators when you were at Not North Carolina? Neither. Huh. So, how, so tell me how you got interested in so, this science that had come out of Ned Sharpless's lab. So, and so Ned was uh, in the Department of Genetics. I was in the Department of Pharmacology. I was on the third floor. He was on the second floor. We've never had a conversation literally in the 10 years I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> because no department overlap is just because yeah. it, that's before yeah. he became, became yeah right and I mean it's interesting because this is not uncommon at at large schools or medical centers right is that people who work even in the same building may never actually yeah. meet each other in person so, and so yeah. the 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 first time we I mean sort of I knew of his science and you know that that kind of thing from just sort of presentations and papers but the the commonality was my graduate student did a postdoc in his lab and so mm. that kind of was the the common thread that sort of I started to be more aware of the research in his lab because I heard from Patrick sort of about what he was doing and so that's kind of what how it became uh, sort of I became more aware of what he does and I could see quality of research and so sort of you know, it's one of those things when you're a good scientist, you look out for other good scientists sure. to work with because that immediately builds trust and makes things easier. And so through Patrick, I could see uh, sort of the quality of research being done, you know, sort of how people are being thoughtful, how they can develop big ideas, but also be really thorough about establishing it. All of that was really appealing to me. All of that was really appealing to me. And, and but in the meantime, I, I never thought I'm going to start a startup. So I just, I wanted to do more translation. And so I, I just decided that academia wasn't a path to do that mm, yeah. because I was a PhD and there was really no way for me to do translation without becoming MD. And so I left UNC looking, so we're in the Research Triangle Park. There is a ton of companies. And so I sort of left thinking that I'm going to join one of the companies to do translation. Huh. And Incidentally, they were thinking that and sort of his his lab were thinking of starting a company and then Patrick knew I left. And so that was sort of serendipitously they're like, well, we should ask Natalia if she wants to run this. <laughs> and and I said no, because I'm like, I don't know what I don't want to do a company. And but then I saw the data and I, it's the, the more I heard what they're doing, why they're doing it, what is the data? how far they've gotten the assay, the more I heard about it, I, yeah. I just couldn't say so, no. So that's super interesting. So, I mean, I think anytime you sit down and talk with someone, it ends up most people have a non-traditional path, yeah. but everybody's non-traditional path is different, right? Yeah. So so it, let, me, let me see if I got this correct. So you were a faculty member in mm -hmm. academia doing research on cancer, yep. and you were you recognized that you did not see a path to translation there, at least that was at the rate that you wanted to go at. So you left academia with the intention of joining a company, but not starting yeah, a company. And absolutely. you didn't know what company you were going to well, join at that point. Because I've, you know, like when you work in academia, I didn't know what starting sure. a company Yeah, needs. I get it. Believe me, I you get know? it. <laughs> it's, 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 well, it's very similar to yours, right? Like, well, I didn't know first thing about it. And yeah. I'm not a big risk taker, so I'm like... Uh, I, well, I... You took a pretty big risk. <laughs> it was calculated risk. That's the difference. But it's but it was that right. It's sort of it's it was just this idea that are you sure you want me because I don't know anything about it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So so then and then you you realized that through the through a series of conversations with Ned or and assume I'm assuming there were other people around sure. him who wanted to commercialize this that this was a this this was an idea that was beyond the stage where it was just an idea and it was ready to actually be brought yep. into the for-profit sector. And so they convinced you to be yep. CEO of this company and, yep. and go for it. Yep. Awesome. And that's, and that's exactly. And that, this, sorry, this was how many years ago? This was 2003. Okay. So 
13. <laughs> okay. So it's, <laughs> 11. it's, 11. it's been a decade. Almost 11. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. And it's, and it's the, so, so the essay, just sort of to bring everybody else in the loop. So the essay we're talking about is ability to measure sellers and essence and blood in human samples. And so they've done a study in, in volunteers. So they, they could, they knew how to measure it in humans, what subtype was more appropriate. So all that sort of R and D was done. Right. What was not clear is what are you going to do with it? Right. And back in the day, the epigenetic clocks were just starting to so horror right. already published his. And so they're starting to come up. And so we kind of toyed with this idea of, well, maybe this could be another biologic measure. Maybe we can report it in years. And so that's kind of kind of how it started. Yeah, I mean, this is this is important to kind of take people back, right? Because because I don't think people realize how much the uh, concept and acceptance of biological age clocks or at least biomarkers of aging has evolved yep. in 10 years. Yep. So back then, I mean, now I think if somebody said, I have a really good senescence you know, test, right? In in humans where I can measure senescence and autophagy, by the way, people would be like, oh my God, that's great. It's obvious how you use it. Back then it probably was a little less obvious. Not at all. Not at all. And that's, and that was because it's also the, the, the aging longevity space, space did not exist. Yeah. There was biology of aging research. And then there was a, like, we all knew aging is important, but there was no commercial path to it. So, right. The commercial path, when we started, the commercial path was your traditional, you take this, you go into people getting cardiac surgery, people getting cancer. Should they get this kind of chemo or that kind of chemo? It's It was still a risk, aging as a as a risk factor with, in the context of very specific disease, whether right. it's a companion or so it's a very traditional thinking of diagnostic and then aging, you just happen to yeah. measure aging yeah. versus you're measuring aging, therefore it's different. So maybe let's let's take a step back and then we'll talk about kind of what this means in, in the, the clinical practice in these longevity or concierge sure. clinics. What does the test actually measure? Yes. So, so the test is called Sapirx and it measures fundamentally, it measures two things. So it measures cellular senescence. So it's basically senescence load in blood. And it measures immune system. So we use a metric that we call immune longevity score. But basically, it's a composite of a bunch of markers. And so so you get your cellular senescence and you get your immune longevity score. So the reason we measure those two things and the way sort of how we developed and how we thought about it and how it fits in the field is you... Um, so so when there's a damage that can cause senescent cells, your body is really good about clearing the senescent cells, right? So immune, so they secrete certain cytokines that attract the immune system and the immune system can clear those cells out. So it's a balance, right? And so when you're younger and your immune system is good, or even if you're older, if your immune system is good, right. you might be very effective at clearing those. As your immune system declines, you can start accumulating. There is a flip side to that. If you accumulate senescent cells for some reason, you have a lot of stress coming in and you're accumulating senescent cells really fast, your immune system might be fine, but right. it cannot keep That's up. That's what I was just going to ask. Yeah. So you get both. You ha And so we have people who have accelerated cellular senescence, but normal immune system. You have people who have poor immune system, but normal senescence so far. And again, how are, okay, so, so the, 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 Assessment for immune age mm -hmm. is, um, I get that it's a bunch of markers, That's right. yeah. but I was gonna, yeah. can you simplify? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's, I was going to go into okay. that next. So, okay. so we call it immune longevity score. So when we report to the clinics, what we're trying to do is we're trying to give, so it's not an age, right? Like mm -hmm. it's not an age yeah. number. So it's not as simple as like, oh, well, your 50 year old patient is actually 45 biologically. So we don't do it that way intentionally. And one of, it would make it very easy because everybody understands, oh, I'm 50 and this is 46 and Delta is 4. It's a very easy thing for the you know human brain to digest, but it lacks clinical actionability and it lacks ability to understand why. So even though it complicates sort of our life and our ability <laughs> to re return the results and explain the results, we chose that path because we believe that if you understand why, then you can tailor treatments. And so what we do is we return the actual number. So we show you what the population distribution is, we show you what the average is, and we show you where your patient is. Right. So then we can talk, so we not just tell you if it's high or low, we actually show you where the patient is, right? And then we provide longitudinal data so you can see how you're improving. Same for immune function. And the reason we do that is that, right? Because it's you can have a treatment that improved your cell. Let's say you need to improve both. 
you improved cell senescence, but the immune function didn't change. Okay, well, now I need to, like, this worked. Okay, so we can put the pin on that. Let's work on this. So it gives you more insight because some treatments can do one or the other or both or neither or make both worse. We don't know. In longevity space, nobody knows what those treatments do yeah. in humans. Right? Yeah. And so to be able to see under and be able to be as specific as possible which exact biologic process it's a, it's affecting is really important because that gives you information right. versus, you know, I changed it by three. So for the immune function, so because, so, immu so senescent cells are cleared by the immune system. In the immune system, uh, there's a sort of quick course on the immune system, uh, very high level course on the immune system. <laughs> so in the immune system, there are two types of cells that can clear things. So there is natural killer cells, which that's why they're called natural killer cells. So that's their na native sort of state. They're clearing other cells. And then there is uh, T cells that are CD8 positive cells. So those are also called sometimes cytotoxic cells. So those can also clear. So it appears to be that cellular senescent cells are cleared by the CD8 cells. They can be cleared by the NK cells, but it seems to be by the time you age, your NK cells become so bad they no longer function. Got it. But CD8 cells work. And so what we're measuring is we're measuring metrics of these T cells. So for when when there is a challenge, so you're sort of your, you know, your uh, innate immune system response and then propagates a signal to adaptive immune system. T cells are really critical for that. So they prolif so they get activated, they proliferate, and then they um, and then they respond and then they become memory cells, right? So so we measure proliferation because ability to respond. So mm -hmm. if you don't proliferate, nothing is going to happen, right? Then we measure T cell exhaustion. So in um, in Joan Manick's study in the in the older people getting immune uh, immune vaccine with treated with yeah. yeah, exactly. So the out of all the 30 some cell type blood cell types they ever looked at t cell exhaustion was the thing that rapamycin improved yeah so if you change just t cell exhaustion in, in this case it was cd4 and cd8 so if you change just t cell exhaustion you can actually improve immune function as a whole because vaccine response is not right one and thing. and i think this this might be important you tell me if if i'm wrong in jones studies those people were treated with everolimus, which is essentially, we can think sure. of it like rapamycin, sure. for six weeks, and then there was a two-week washout, was and a washout. then they got yep. the vaccine yep. response. So the yep. question, so this so this change in T-cell exhaustion, I'm assuming was post-washout, maybe it's, even post-vaccine. It's, it's permanent. That's that because, it, because so, ex, so exhaustion, so a lot of immunotherapies are targeting exhaustion, T-cell exhaustion. Uh -huh. Because this is sort of the, they're fundamental to their ability to cell response, so it's not something that fluctuates very quickly. Well, what I was going to ask though is, what do you think would happen if you measured that? And maybe you have data on this now from from the Sapir test. If you measured that while still taking rapamycin, so so, so it, does it does it require the washout or it that, that's what I'm? It asking. does not require. So the reason she did a washout, she wanted to make sure that sort of if there was some transient response that yeah. that stabilized at least. My well, and right? and also I think you know when that first study was done. Most people still strongly thought of rapamycin yeah. as, an, as an immune suppressant, right? So Absolutely. I think they also didn't want to have yeah. any residual yeah, immune just suppression. Contamination. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so I, so we have data, and uh, and including my personal experience data. So we see the change in T cell exhaustion within four weeks of taking rapamycin. Got it. Even so, you can be on for six weeks, six months, and so we see it within a few weeks, and then it's sustained through the course. So it's not. A function of washout. It's not a function of months of treatment. It's yeah. it's none of that, right? Yeah. So it's it's a response to rapamycin. And am I wrong in thinking that T cell exhaustion, if you were to plot that just as a function of age, is grow, going up with age? Yep. Okay. And does it look linear? Does it look sort of like a lot of other age? It doesn't things? because all the we all have vastly different immune systems. Okay. And so immune function, as in general, declines with age. But there is a huge, just like senescence, really, but yeah. even more so, there is a huge a lot of variation. Yeah. The last thing we measure, I want to mention, is the marker we call autophagy inhibition. Right. And that is so not to be confused with autophagy. You you know you ate a cookie and now you have glucose response and you have autophagy, so it's still going through AMPTOR, but 
the, the, this particular marker is really important for T-cell function. So autophagy in general that clears sort of things from the cell, right? So, so T-cell, for those who know, T-cell is a little tiny ball and most of the cell is a nucleus. So there is very little room in the cytoplasm. So T-cell cannot afford to have organelles and all this other damage that is kind of hanging out mm -hmm. on the cytoplasm mm -hmm. because then all the trafficking, all the cell signaling is right. dampened. So it's really critical for T-cell for their ability to function, to be able to get rid of all that damage. So autophagy is essential Got it. for T-cell function. So it's not responding to nutrient stress. It's just, it's essential for its function. So autophagy is sort of, a, a, I hate to say it this way, but always on. Exactly, it's, exactly. It's, it's, autophagy is needed for degradation. It's not response to nutrients. But because T-cells work all the time, is it needed. mTOR regulated it in is. T cells? Okay. It is. It is. It's microautophagy, so it's the same yeah. idea. Yeah. It's just yeah. it's just not to connect this for people, right? I think this is this is this is a good time to 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 just give some definitions, right? So autophagy, I'm sure most people are aware, is the sort of recycling center of the cell. It is um, negatively regulated by mTOR, yep. so turning down mTOR with rapamycin turns up autophagy. Inhibition of macroautophagy is one of the hallmarks of aging. So we're talking about kind of fundamental stuff here, important for yep. the biology of aging. But in T cells, it's just regulated a little bit differently. It's well, it's function. And it's it's essential basically for the yeah. cells to do their function, but it's also sort of at a, a higher constitutive yeah. level exactly. in T cells than and in other parts of the body. And that recycling, I mean, autoph like recycling as autophagy function is important yeah. in all cells. But so, in T cells, it's extremely critical. So is it your uh, belief then that uh, inhibition of macroautophagy as a one of the hallmarks of aging is potentially even more important yes. in T cells than in other parts of the body? Yes. So, and that's a belief. So there are people working on autophagy in T cells specifically as sort of, as so papers will come out, I'm yep. sure. So it is at this point, it's a belief. But I do believe that, uh, I mean, autophagy is, I mean, as you know, with mTOR, autophagy is really central to yep. all sorts of things. Autophagy is essential for senescent cells to secrete cytokines. So autophagy is important for all sorts of things, not just right. nutrient response in right. a sort of crude, And there's also this sort of way. misperception that turning up autophagy is always a, it's good, a good thing, thing right? Exactly. That's not true. It's like Reg anything, Regulated right? pathway yeah. is good, yeah. unregulated, Turning it up too bad. far can exactly. be bad, constitutive exactly. hyperactivation exactly. of autophagy. Exactly. Yep. And, it's, and I think the challenge, and that's autophagy is really hard to measure, like, sort of nutrient-induced autophagy is really hard to measure because of that, because it's very dynamic. And we don't know what is... Is it higher level or is it higher activity? What does high activity mean? Yeah. So there is all these things that we just don't know because we can't measure it. In so humans. you have a marker though that is a marker of autophagy inhibition. Yes. And um, so a couple of questions there. One is: Is it responsive to rapamycin? So, uh, so it's a so it's a receptor. It's a cell sulfur receptor that then signals intracellularly. And it can buy, so the reason it, it inhibits autophagy, it binds directly to Becklin 1, or Becklin 2. Uh -huh, okay. So it is a direct, part of the machine, it's not right? yep. sort of, you know, like it's a direct response. So um, the, 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 studies, the studies were done in NK cells, and the study showed that it's, it inhibits rapamycin response, but also when you give people rapamycin, it also increases it. So it seems like it's a feedback loop. Interesting. Okay. And if you fast, it goes down. So there is sort of, it, it's, it seems to be, so there is very little known on this in the aging space, like literally two papers. So it's, it's known that it's, it's increased in people who are aging compared to middle age versus younger age. And then uh, T cells, so memory cells become bad, basically. So they become thermally differentiated and longer respond. They if they more, have high levels of this If they have high marker. level, they're more likely to proliferate but then die instead of actually respond. So they just become deregulated, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. So if they have that. But a lot of work in NK cells showed that, um, well, in some of it in T cells, in the, in the infectious disease space, a lot of that immunology research, there is a lot of data in infectious disease that hasn't been translated. And so in that space... People who have either bacterial or viral infection, whether it's meningitis, uh, I mean, there's all sorts of things, sort of uh, tuberculosis, there's all sorts of kind of bacterial and viral infections. If you look at people who recovered versus people who didn't recover, that marker is on. So it seems to be sort of the chronic inflammation kind of, you know, your immune system is not doing so well right. response. Right. And so in the infectious disease space, there's a ton of data on it. Yeah. So, so. Just, just to be clear, though, so this marker, I guess the question in my mind is, like, you have somebody who has a high level of this marker. Yep. You probably have some data on this. They start taking rapamycin. 
Does it go down? Does it go up? And secondarily to that, in a context like that, is it actually reflecting autophagy activity or flux or whatever? The last, we have no idea. Yeah. Because that's a study that, you know, it's really yeah, hard yeah, it's to do complicated. So yeah, that's, absolutely. that we have no idea. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely something that we need to work on and sort of collaborate with people to establish that. Well, first of all, figure out what's how, are you how to measure, measure the humans flux without of autophagy. Yeah. Also without <laughs> doing it biopsy, <laughs> right. frankly, right. right? Because, you know, it's not something longevity clinics are eager to do. Yeah. Uh, or really any participants <laughs> for that matter. Um. So, so, that, so that's that. But I think the... So one thing to say, so we, so the, um, so Sapir X is not available commercially. Right. Uh, we're launching. I was going to ask, people are going to want to know how they can get it. So, so we're launching in a couple months. You can come to OptiSpan and get That's your right. Sapir test. That's right. That's <laughs> right. So we're launching in a couple months. But before that, just being a scientist, you know, founded and driven company, what we wanted to do and we wanted to pilot and see Remember, the company started with the question of, is there a clinical utility for this, right? So what we wanted to do is we wanted to see, is there a clinical utility for this? And so what we did is we took, um, we took the test and we created early access program. So it's RB regulated with all the sort of paperwork that goes with it, investigators are trained, all of that. And so we went to longevity medicine clinics and sort of we asked, we asked clinicians to to test and here's what we're gonna do here is what it looks like here's what it's gonna tell you are you interested yeah. and so we have a number of clinics on board with their so optispan being one of those clinics in our early access program and so the goal of the early access program was to understand whether a test will be used to understand whether it has any value and i don't mean financial i mean actually is it right. helpful to is people? it actionable is it actionable yep. and is it helpful to people right we wanted to make sure it doesn't scare people. We wanted to make sure that the information you deliver, again, is not just some random number right. that you either ignore or are happy about, but actually something you can use. And then we, the sort of the, uh, you know, the gravy sort of on top of that is that these are clinics that are using treatments at treating their patients. I mean, physicians know their patients, right? So they're treating patients in the way they think their patients need to be treated. This is as close to the real world as it gets. Right. They're getting all sorts of treatments that are clinically important, depending on their medical history, depending on their family history, depending on what they want to do, what yep. their longevity goals are. So we're so we have this registry where we, we're measuring senescence and immune function, but in the meantime, we're collecting data on interventions. So we're creating this matrix of People, these are interventions and drugs and, you know, whatever supplements, whatever people got. Here's what happens to senescence. Here's what happens to immune longevity. And so, so to sort of the way to answer your question, Rapamycin, we don't know yet. So we, because we are still blinded to who took Rapamycin because I'm, I'm trying ah, to collect okay. more information. Interesting. So I know in my own case, the autophagy inhibitor did not change, but my level was low to start with. Mm -hmm. So would it be high? Would I not respond to robomycin, yeah, or right. would it, like I don't know? Yeah, right. So that's sort of. But in okay. the clinic, we are collecting the data. So basically, the idea is to collect the data. I mean, we're finding things that, like we. So when when we started the company, the sort of the kind of you know thinking in the field was cell senescence cannot be decreased, like it can go up, or it kind right. of you know it's you cannot right. decrease cell senescence. Right. We're finding out that's absolutely not true. In almost thirty percent patients using longevity treatments available today and by treatments i don't some of them could be lifestyle it doesn't mean yeah. drugs so at this point though you don't know you don't know which treatments are high, most highly correlated we don't know with... which treatments most likely correlate we also don't know was it even intentional or yeah. people went to longevity medicine and said you know i really need to get my act together and start doing it without even advice of the doctor right. they start right. you know eating better right. and exercising so it might not have been intentional with the goal of being senolytic and i think that's another important point that when people think, so when we return results, and that's, we worked really hard with physicians on that, when we turn, return the result and we say somebody's cellular senescence is high, what we want to make sure people understand is cellular senescence is high does not make equal you should give them a senolytic. Because first of all, there is no evidence to date in humans that senolytics, what we think of senolytics as DNQ and facetin, there's yeah. no evidence that those work in humans. Right. Zero evidence. There's, I mean, I think even questionable evidence in animals for some of these, sure. you know, and, at but, least you the know, natural part and, product and senolytics. Exactly. And that's what I mean. And it's yeah. it's not just doses and duration. It's, there is no evidence. So we don't want physicians to think that the patient who has cell senescence right. should automatically get this because right. I don't believe it works. And, you know, I don't 
So the way we think about it when we work with our doctors, the way we think about it is indirect, right? So if you give somebody a treatment and you see cellular senescence go down to the to your point of biomarkers being connected, uh, hallmarks being connected, if your senescence cells goes down, that is a senolytic effect, whether it's direct or indirect, right? I don't care if it's seromorphic, it right. doesn't matter, right? right? Your cellular senescence go down. Cellular senescence is a fundamental measure of aging. So if you can decrease cellular senescence, you know you're secreting less cytokines, you have less senescence cells. Again, right. it doesn't matter what does it. It doesn't matter if it's a supplement, if it's a lifestyle, it doesn't matter. If you can decrease your cell and cell load without taking a senolytic, yeah. good for you. And yeah. so when we see the decreases in senescence, it's not because everybody's getting senolytic. I just want to make sure it's sure. clear that it's not everybody's on DMQ and that's what's happening. Well, I mean, and in fact, you would, again, I, so a so couple couple thoughts. One is you've got a tool to test these things now, exactly. which is great. Exactly. <laughs> we should do that. Exactly. Um, but also, I mean, you can make a plausible guess. You know, fasting is probably going to reduce the senescence signal. Rapamycin is probably going to reduce the senescence signal. We know it does in mice. It's not a senolytic, but it's, well, it's yeah. senomorphic, yeah. which yeah. is, you know, immune, immune, shut down, it's a, well, the, it's response, shut yeah. down the senescence well, plus immune signaling. Response. Yeah, yeah it makes, right. And so this that's the other piece, right? It's not only the chemical itself or the intervention itself killing the senescent cell, if it is restoring immune function, you exactly. will get natural immune clearance exactly. of the senescent exactly. cell. Exactly. And to the fasting, again, why there is so little data in humans and we just, we have to measure, we can't assume. Yeah. So we had a study with pre-diabetics who went on a diet and basically 25% of them decreased their senescence. Well, 25% increased their senescence. So. Yeah. So you did a study. Interesting. So, but it's like you have you have to do these things. You can't yeah, just assume. Right. I, absolutely. You I, know, I mean, it's, it's you can't translate from model arguments. You can't assume. I hate to admit it, but I'm probably wrong 50 percent of the time in how an well, experiment's going to come out. But that's, that's why science. you got to do but it. But that's yeah, why you I do agree. it. That's what I mean. That's but that's why it's so important to measure in humans and not just like, oh, well, this works in humans, monkeys. I don't care where. Yeah. Yeah. Like you cannot, or certainly doses like this. It's really important to know what you're doing because again, if the goal is to improve over time yeah. and not just for five minutes. You need to make sure that's a sustainable Do you know if any of these clinical trials that are ongoing for senolytics are actually using technologies like this to measure cellular senescence? So the trial the trial that is Alzheimer's trial is so yes, they're using it. They're using Sapir. Great. Yeah. 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 I mean, I just, I know there have been a bunch that were done out of the Mayo, usually underpowered so they're, small they're, studies. But. So they're, they're using similar technology to ours from what I understand. Yeah. It's all yeah. sort of on the yeah. lock and key. From what I understand, they're using some technology. The Wake Forest study on Alzheimer's that is randomized, their pre-treatment, post-treatment, and then I think every three months for a year because they yeah. think it's going to go down and then go back up. So they're trying to catch the rebound. So that's, that's, that's using Sapir. So, I mean, it seems like there are some real big opportunities here to use this test to assess whether or not specific interventions that people are interested in exactly. reduce senescence burden. Exactly. Exactly. And that's and that is basically the goal of the registry. It's not let's test somebody everybody for senescence so they know their number. The goal is to again to know what to do with it and not with the future, like the paper I sent you about in case therapy is being developed for senescence. Yeah. That would be wonderful, but that's 10 years away. Right. Like it's not, I right. mean, things are coming, right. but it's not right. now, not right? So knowing soon. that things yeah. exist right now, like that's that's a gift. Right, right. Um, and then I, I want to talk a little bit about the idea. So, I mean, clearly, you know, in the, in the longevity field, we recognize that senescence cell burden goes up with age. The mindset is, Reduce senescent cells, always good, but that's not always the case, right? Correct. So, so what are the what's the situation where too little senescence is actually detrimental? So, so let's 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 address two things. So, first of all, let's address senescence in blood versus tissues, mm -hmm. and then we can talk about high and low level relate to that. So, essentially, every cell, as far as we know, at least most cells, can become senescent. So what senescence mean is there is a permanent growth arrest that you are resistant to apoptosis, but you're no longer proliferating, and then you're secreting cytokines. That's essentially what the term means, right? So every, any cell can become that, and most of them express P16 marker senescence. So that what and that, is that? That's what that's what we, test is that's what we measure, P16. and that's what Nat Sharpless developed in yep. T cells, right? So most cells express that, but there are some. You can have you know histones, and the, so there's like lemon, and there's other markers. So 
there is there is sort of in the field there is this idea that there is a good senescence and a bad senescence because sometimes so permanently arrested cells may be good for you. Like during embryonic development, permanently arrested cells means your tissue develops properly, that then they get cleared when you sort of were born, right? Sure. So there is a biological place for that. So in it, like in liver, senescent cells might have that or maybe in the skeletal muscle. So when we measure things in blood, so first of all, and there was a sort of this beautiful paper from Morton's lab on AI where they identified cells using AI. So just by just for physiological distortion, essentially. So when they, so completely unrelated to biomarker, well, I guess it is a biomarker, size is a biomarker, I guess, <laughs> right. in that sense. But it basically AI identified cells based on morphology. Okay. So then they went back and said, are they, are they P16 expressing? Are they P21? Are they beta gal? And my one. These are all markers of senescence. 53, I think, yeah. yeah. And P16 gave you 0.86 correlation coefficient as a single marker. Yeah. So can we have other markers? Sure, but P16 gives you 90, almost 90% of it, right? So, so those cells express P16, they might be expressing other things, and they might be even doing other things. So is that a critical thing to know which which cells are senescence in every tissue and what they do. It's absolute, for, from basic research standpoint, we, if we are to develop senes senolytic therapies, yeah. we have to know. Right. Because that's adverse events, right? We have to know what to target, what not to target, what is a phenotype, what is adverse, what is not, right? We have to know. From the clinical perspective, when we measure P16 in blood, P16 in blood is a marker of aging. There's no, nothing good that P16 does in blood. Right? Okay. So increase in P of P16 in blood is a marker of organismal aging, but it's also... So what makes you so confident that there's nothing good that Because P16 no one ever showed anything. Oh, and so, so NIH, so I'm sure you're familiar with that. So NIH has this SENNET. SENNET, yeah. Uh, network, I guess, yep. or consortium yep. or sort of that basically they're looking, the idea is to take humans and to look at every tissue and do RNA-seq and proteome and all this other stuff to identify, basically to you know, senescence atlas, right? So develop yep. this sort of map of senescent cells. And that's coming. And that's what I mean. From, from a biology standpoint, it's extremely important to know what to target. So when we measure P16 in blood, low levels are bad. High levels are bad. Intermediate is good. So what we spend, and that's what it took thousands of samples to try to understand where where that range is. Is it just yeah. a statistical fifty percent? So so to your question, why so so no one ever found a function for P sixteen in blood that is positive. Like in liver, it's important for cell cell contact. If you take the cells out, you get fibrosis. Yeah. It's so it's sort of it's a it's growth arrest function. Right. Blood doesn't have growth arrest function. Like that's not how blood cells work. Like that's not needed, right? I mean, there's sort of there there the way to keep the T cells from sort of you know clone from clonal expansion is different than you have in tissue where there's cell cell contact. Okay. Right. So, so so are you saying that in blood senescence is not an anti cancer mechanism? It is. That's why low is bad. Okay. So there is a function for senescence in blood. No. No. What I, no. What <laughs> I meant is above certain threshold. Ah. So low that's why low is bad. So the, so some levels are needed. Yeah. But high there is no like so in liver high senescence is protective. Okay. In blood Got it. high senescence sorry I I misspoke. So, so high senescence is so never high good senescence in blood. senescence is never good in blood. Exactly. Got it. But senescence is needed. So what um so so when we when we work with these longevity clinics and so now that we have many 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 samples we can see the trends where low senescence People who have low senescence fall into two categories. They're either really good with their sort of, they have longevity gene, they are really good with their practices, or they have a genetic predisposition to heart disease and cancer. And they all kind of have the same number. Got it. So that's where, again, the clinician needs to be involved because they need to figure out which group you're in before you scare people into you might have cancer. And and so they have a high breed predisposition to cancer. So, exactly. so let me Genetic. Make, let me be sure Genetic. I'm clear. Yes. Right. This is not so very low levels of senescence in blood is not a predictor that you have cancer. Not at all. It's not it's like not the, the diagnostic. liquid biopsy it's not the diagnostic. grail test. Not at all. But it suggests that you may have a genetic predisposition yes. that's causing you to have low senescence, and a consequence of that sort of genetic 
inability to mount a senescence yeah. response is you're predisposed to cancer. Exactly. So it's it basically increases your chances. Right. Right. And, so and and do you know what the locus is that the that so those... in heart disease it's a nine p twenty one. Uh huh. So nine p twenty one locus. So the second most commonly mutated from GWAS that is the second most commonly mutated locus in the human genome is nine p twenty one. So that locus has a bunch of I mean, they're called SNPs, so a bunch of single nucleotide uh, mutations right. that can predispose you to diabetes, to heart disease, to cancer, to all sorts of stuff. So there is a cluster of these mutations that occurs right after the P16 gene. So it's in the kind of, and so it, it affects the expression of the right. gene, like through three prime TR. So there's sort of, yep. there's a kind of biology behind it. So people who have mutations in that locus tend to have predisposition to the heart disease. In cancer, sometimes it's deletion, sometimes, so in cancer, it's less clear that it's not a SNP anymore. Mm -hmm. It's more of other things. So it's harder to say, so for heart disease, we can validate that by just genotyping in 9 yeah. 21 That's what I was going to ask. I mean, so, cancer, so, you... so does it make sense in people who have that phenotype of very low senescence mm -hmm. to go get a, get that region of the genome deeply sequenced and, and see if you have a at least a known mutation that would predispose so you. So at, at UNC, people who have familial history of pancreatic cancer, they they get sent for sequencing, including for P16, walking mm -hmm. through the door. Yeah. Like that's just, so for certain cancers. Well, but what I'm saying is if your test mm -hmm. says somebody has very low senescence, does it make sense for them to go get that locus sequenced? If it, Yes, especially if they have family history. So it's sort of if you know that there is, you know, mothers or father's side, if you have a family history of cancer. So we've had, uh, so far, we've had about a dozen people who have really low senescence who we know. Yeah. So yep. there is sort of, there is clinics and then there is kind of- And you have must our, have like your own internal threshold that's like a red flag. Exactly. Yeah. And we also, because we also, we sort of, we have the kind of the internal research for, where we know people. So mm -hmm. we know sort of their history and medical yeah. history. And and so, yeah. so among people, so there's more people with low senescence in longevity clinics who we don't know. But pe sure. among people we know, it's about a dozen. And I would say it breaks about 70, 30, about 70 people have low senescence because they either have longevity gene or, you know, they have really good health practice. So they have no history of heart disease or cancer in their family. And when they, when we sent them for sequencing, it comes back as a sort of, as a heterozygous. So therefore it's not a risk. They say yeah. only homozygous is a risk. Yeah. So it's, so, but it would absolutely make sense to do that. I mean, again, you know, if, that's the beauty of longevity medicine. These are people who are coming back to see the physician over and over again. It's not it's not a one time appointment. And so, like this is something you might want to not an MD, so not a medical advice, but this is something that you might want to keep an eye on because you have that predisposition. So again, so in heart disease, there is not there's still sort of argument of what like whether it's actually mechanistically causing heart disease, like there's a smooth muscle overgrowth, and so is it actually damaging the heart disease, and, or is it just happens to be missing P16 and it doesn't matter, right? Yeah. So in theory, there is sort of, there is an argument there. In cancer, it is, a, P16 is a tumor suppressor. So right. in cancer, it is right. known that it's Makes a tumor sense. suppressor, and when sort of, when before cancer becomes basically cancerous, the whole locus gets deleted. So in a lot of cases that happens. In some cancers, it's so expressed. So one interesting thought I have is, I mean, these people who have low levels of senescence, presumably for good reasons, yep. right? So yep. maybe those are people who are, who have their lifestyle dialed in, they're aging more slowly, they're gonna accumulate senescent cells at a slower rate, maybe not at all as they get older. Have you guys thought about, is there a way to design a test for something that you would expect would induce senescence. And I'm, what I'm, what I guess what I'm getting at is, are there, are there people who have low levels of senescence, but who are really good at responding when they no need idea. to? I mean, it's no. sort of a resilience idea, it's, right? That's because I, and then could they clear it quickly? Well, like, and that's that the thing. And, and we struggled with that, right? Because exactly, because it would suggest that your immune system is really good at clearing, like your lifestyle, yeah. but also your immune system is really good at clearing them. Right. So we've struggled with that because it's is it is it that they're not inducing senescence or is it they're clearing and what would you use to, i mean you don't want to use chemotherapy what would you right. use to induce senescence right? right like you don't want to stress people to the point of inducing senescence <laughs> so it's sort of so it's what about an infection what about what about long covid do people who have long covid have a high burden of senescent cells so um according to papers they do we've never looked so i 
tend not to judge other papers until yeah. I do it myself. Yeah, it's super interesting because I've always, you know, had this idea that, that and I mean, there's some data to back it I up. I mean, synalytics were tried as a, as a COVID treatment. So there in is- In long some, COVID? Or? So just in COVID. So synalytics uh, were tried. So it is yeah. definitely a response. I'm thinking, you know, these people who have, yep. have long-term yep. COVID symptoms though, right? And clearly that's, some sort of chronic inflammatory yes. condition. Well, but, and those T cells are really important for right. that. Right. Like so you shown. might you might expect they would have high burden of senescent T cells, Probably. and rapamycin might be really good in those people. And Probably. we've got some reason to believe that. It's so very. It's well this because is, this if is you, testable. If your immune system is is degraded, then <laughs> anybody out there who wants to fund a clinical trial, we got a biomarker, we got a drug. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> but it's no, it's it is it is absolutely true, and I mean I think it's in general. Anything that affects your immune system, whether it's you know CMV or you got yeah, a BV, sure, infect, a bunch it doesn't it doesn't matter agents, what yeah. it is, right? So if what if something is affecting your immune system, your odds of now increasing your senescent load is pretty high. You don't have to really change anything. It's your, if your immune system changes, right? Like it will increase, right. and that's why well interested in testing. Right. And but if you make your immune system better, then you should be you able should to clear. see a decrease. Exactly, yeah, exactly. And so that's. That is, so if you ask me a question of how soon does it happen, we don't know. Because yeah. that is something we're watching because, you know, so it's clearly not a month for two months. It clearly takes time. So you must have some people, though, in the clinics that you're working with who had high senescent burden who then went on something like rapamycin. And so, again, maybe you don't know right now, but that data should start to come out. When will you be able to unblind and start have, to get that data? So, so we can unblind any time. It's it's too tantalizing to actually unblind until we have power because then what are you gonna sure. do with it? Yeah. Right. It's then you're just gonna be upset. Well, at least I'll be obsessing over it. Yeah. <laughs> so so but so we have the first eighty people already have at least two visits. Some of them have five. Okay. So so it's it's coming. It's coming because it's the registry is almost two years old now. Yeah. Come on, guys. Let's <laughs> let's yeah. all some All right. people. Cool. No, it's it's coming. So, okay, so this this is fantastic. The last thing I want to talk about is rapamycin. Mm -hmm. And I know that you've mentioned a couple of times that your own experience with rapamycin yep. has sort of backed some of this up. So are you willing to share Absolutely. kind of what has been your sort of what? So first of all, what got you, what got you interested in potentially mm -hmm. using rapamycin off label and what happened? It's it's actually really similar to your situation where I was kind of uh, in the position where I decided what do I have to lose? And, you know, the worst case scenario, I feel nothing. So I just kind of so, so let me just clarify. By that you mean that you were convinced that the that it was safe at the doses that we're talking I about was, people using. I was convinced that I'm enough of a scientist that if I do it carefully, yeah. slowly dosing, slowly increasing, monitoring the level, yeah. knowing what the half-life is, yeah. that it, taking a journal, like that yeah. I can monitor, doing yeah. lipid Actually, testing, doing Actually, I think I'm glad insulin. you said that because I think that's really important because I think that, you know, we certainly don't want to suggest that people go out and start using no, rapamycin without a physician or without, like you said, I mean, it's, having you have, the mindset You have to have a physician to write a prescription for rapamycin in the first place, which I had a physician to write. But then I put a lot more money into it because I wanted to make sure that I have a lipid testing and diabetes yeah, test. Right. Like I, I, because all of that was important to me, even though my clinician was fine with not doing it. Yeah. So it's sort of, it was an investment. Right. But that's so I so why I started. Which is actually sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, yeah. but that's actually pretty interesting because you do see that a lot of physicians who are prescribing rapamycin off label are not really concerned with monitoring biomarkers, which I agree with you. I mean, I think we know We don't know. Well, we do know we do. that at least some small fraction of people will experience hypercholesterol. That's what I mean. We don't right? know who will, who wouldn't, <laughs> so what those. We don't know, you right? You probably so, want to monitor yeah. some of these things, exactly. like lipids, like glucose. Glucose, exactly. Right? Exactly. Because you might, it might be only 1%, but if you're that 1%, you probably want to know. So exactly. anyways, yeah, exactly. and it's so, sort of striking to me how many positions are a bit, at least to my view, cavalier about Well, and about it's this. sort of, to me, it's kind of also striking how it's switching from you should never take rapamycin as immunosuppressive to like, oh, sure, rapamycin for all here, take <laughs> yeah. some. Like, let's go with six mix. The pendulum mix. is Let's go with six and, mix, yeah. for example. Like, it's, there's no sort of, it's becoming. That's a harder question. Like, what is, this is, I think, actually a challenge. I'd be interested to know mm -hmm. if you've thought of anything I haven't had, which is this question of um, how do you know if it's working? So, well, so for Besides me. Besides the so spear me, test. Well, no, but I mean, for me, it was easy because I, I mean, I could tell, right? So, so anyway, so for those who don't know me, I am a very skeptical scientist. Probably on par with you, I would guess. <laughs> like, I'm definitely That's very... saying something. Well, I'm a very skeptical scientist. I was trained that way. I'm very diligent in the lab. Like, it's... Like, I'm a very skeptical scientist. So just because somebody did something or somebody said something is not going to sway me. Same goes for placebo effect. 
I did not think it will work. Yeah. Because I yeah, also also right. did it before you did it for your frozen shoulders, so I didn't know your experience yet, and which I had frozen shoulder twice before you, so I wish you know that I had to like you know power through for a year, yeah. and I wish you know I knew that <laughs> you know I <laughs> right. wish I thought of that then, but um but it's so so with COVID, so I had the COVID early on, and then uh, you know being stuck at home, worrying about the company, all of that, you know working from kitchen. You were the stressed out CEO. Stressed out CEO who's working from kitchen, yeah. snacking. None of that was helpful. Also, it it turns out I went to get. I have a family history of heart disease, so I went to get a CAC score and discovered that apparently I have a collapsed lung from back when I had COVID, wow. which no one ever looked wow. because I'm healthy, right? So Ooh. so therefore I couldn't exercise. Every time I exercise, I was out of breath, and I'm like, why am I like my heart is fine. Why am I out of breath? Well, that's why. So I had to recover that. But anyway, so I got to the point where, and I've always, I was always active. I always exercised. I like powerlifting. Like, so it's sort of, so it was always kind of my life, but I got to the point where I do a warm up, And to me, that's a workout. Yeah. Like I was just 10 minutes. I was wiped out. I could not, I could not get my heart rate enough to get the ben like a muscle benefit because I was just exhausted. Huh. Like it's, well, even with COVID, like I would lower my head and I would get dizzy. Like it wasn't long COVID in that sense because it wasn't more, but it's, it was bad. Yeah. And so, you know, for somebody who's healthy, all of a sudden I lost like brain fog, just all these things that are not helpful. And so I got to the point where uh, it was, was about a couple of years ago. So, so I was 51. So I got to the point where I'm like, well, this is either going to be my life, which I'm <laughs> not okay with, or yeah. I need to do something about it. I cannot exercise. What can I do? Right. And so that's where I was like, well, you know, rapamycin, so it's supposed to give you more energy. Let's try. And so the way I did this is because there are some data start coming out that women and men might be different and uh, sort of. And so I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to be a scientist and I'm going to do this scientific way. So I started at one MIG. So I was going to take one MIG for two days, for two weeks. So I did it once weekly. So I listened to Peter Atia's podcast with Joan, where, uh, and with, with her former, former PI, or former boss, uh, who talked about dosing. If you dose daily, you inhibit about 50%. But if you dose weekly, you inhibit 100% for two days. And then, right. so that seemed to me that I would want to go that way rest of daily. So, um, so I convinced my functional medicine doctor who does not, did not do rapamycin before me. So he was just willing to give me a prescription and kind of experiment together. Yep. So I convinced him to give him a prescription. And so I started, I did, I did one MIG for a couple of weeks. Then I went to two. Once a week. One once, mig, a week once a week. Then two MIGs, then three MIGs. So I just kind of dialed it out. And I started taking it at one MIG and I could feel it at one MIG. Huh. I felt more energy and I was like, it's gotta be placebo because it's been like a week, right? So, and, uh, so at that point, my partner had COVID and I never got it. And I used to be that person who like, you know, goes to the grocery store in the winter and I'm sick for three weeks. So I was like, oh, there's something going on here. And so, and I start feeling it and I, I could exercise, I could lift heavier. I recover much faster from the exercise than I've, because I've done this before. Right, I know, you know how quickly I recover. Yeah. I can recover faster. The cognition, like all of a sudden I'm, you know, bright eyed, bushy tail. And it's just, it's like, my employees call it Tropomycin Monday when they come in and I'm all <laughs> full of energy and, you know, and, and it's that, right? Because it's all of a sudden, like, and so it's, I could feel it. So you can, I mean, you can call it placebo effect, but A, I didn't think it would work. And then B, like other people were commenting on it and telling yeah, me like, right. what are you on, basically? And so, <laughs> and so I, so I went up to five megs and then I, um, I did that for about, because I dosed up and I went up for, I don't know, 10 weeks or so. And then I stopped. It was right before ARD conference. I stopped because I was done. And so I stopped and within a couple of weeks, I could feel it. Really? I could feel wow. it starting to decline. So huh. it wasn't enough. Interesting. So, because I was like, all oh, men were traveling. It's like, I, so I went back on it and I was on it for another month. And then I stopped and then I was fine and I was stable. So it wasn't enough for me to get those. Mm -hmm. So, so then, and then I kind of start using your approach. Like, so I, from, you know, being a good scientist that handled 50 cell lines, you know, per week, I have, it's not arthritis, but I have like my hands are achy. And so I have like joint aches from that. And so when I feel, start to feel achy, yeah. like I could tell that yeah. I start to feel kind of the aches. And so it's, so I, I did a washout for months and then I kind of started feeling achy again. And then I remembered that low concentration worked for me. So now I only went and I only went to three. I didn't go out because I knew low concentration works for me. And yep. so, and by the way, I didn't, my lipids were fine. Like I didn't have any So effects. no changing no clinical changing chemistry in or anything. Clinical yeah. chemistry, exactly. 
Uh, actually, I think my my hemoglobin went up. Like there were like some good things, but not nothing bad. And uh, and so I went up to three. And so I took Sapir test, well, twice, multiple times, but really twice before yeah. and after for that. And so T cell exhaustion was moved by three mexorapamycin, but not by five. Which is interesting, huh? So, I I I like clinically I could feel it. Yeah. And I I mean I can feel it, now, but it's it's there is. There's a threshold where immune function could be helped with a lower dose. Right. In my case, again, right. N of one, right? Right. But it's it's that, right? And I think that's what like it's okay to experiment, but you have to test, at least for known adverse events, right? You yeah. have to test, you have to be cognizant, you have to be aware, keep a journal, think about it. I think one of the fascinating things too there is that, you know, the dose of rapamycin that is that is gonna give you the change in the immune function that is optimal may be different from exactly. the dose that's going to give you the change in whatever exactly. other tissue we're and talking the, about. Well, right? and if you have, you know, the cardioprotective effects, yeah. is the immune response the same as a heart response? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Right. But that's what yeah. I mean. I think it's so important to test and check right. and test and but check. But at least now, you know, with your test, there is there is a biomarker. Exactly. Right. Which we can start to add to the toolkit. Well, and it's an immune things. function, right? Yeah, like right. Jones study showed right. that. Like, Absolutely. Like that's, yeah. it's not just a marker that changed. Right. It's a marker of immune function that we know is actually a marker of immune function. Right. right. Yeah, so it's, absolutely. you know, if nothing yeah. else, you fix the immune system like that <laughs> right. can be bad. Right. So yeah. I think, I think it's that anyways. And so it's just, it was very, and it's, you know, sort of watching you speak about it. Like that's really why I'm publicly going with it. Yeah. Watching you speak about it was really inspirational because it's, these things are available, but again, you have, one has to be really careful. You yeah, have and I to think remember. that's an important message. And right, I mean, I get, I get that that some people get turned off by the fact that I'm public about the fact that I've used rapamycin and talk about it. But I think you know, both in terms of educating the public and particularly physicians about this, I think there's value. But also in in being able to remind people what you just said that there are, I think, responsible ways to go yeah. about this, so that you know. If rapamycin does have a lot of benefits for a lot of people, we can actually do it yeah. in a way that is going to be hopefully reassuring to the medical yeah. community instead of irresponsible. Well, and again, it puts a power in your hands because yeah. nobody was willing to treat me. I wasn't sick. Right. Like nobody right. was willing to do anything about the fact that right. I cannot exercise. Yeah. So I would <laughs> right. I would have to wait till when. Yeah. Like that's the thing. It's like there was no path for me. Like there was like the frozen shoulder. Like I suffered for a year and a half because it was one and then the other. Like there was no treatment. Right. So it's, it's like, you know. which is still a source of frustration, right? The fact exactly. that 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 even still, you know, again, this gets back to the fact that rapamycin, I think, has an opportunity for some of these conditions, long COVID, frozen shoulder, right? But we need people to step up and support clinical trials to test this absolutely before it's ever going to become widely absolutely. accepted. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's. I mean, it's. I'm. I'm all for testing in the control environment yeah. with proper. Like, I'm all for that. But you have the discovery has to happen. And right. But the nice thing is, with your test, you've actually got a. I think molecularly plausible mechanism that links rapamycin to at least the function of the immune system, right? So again, I think from a from the from the perspective of actually convincing the scientific community, the medical community, I yep. think it's quite powerful. And so again, we Thank just you. really need to be able to move that forward. Thank you. And that's but I mean there. that was the goal. And that's so for like we report immune longevity score, but we also report all the immune markers because we want you to see what changed. Right. And immune longevity is really immune function. It's it's an right? algorithm that puts yeah. all these together that this immune resilience is outcome. Yeah. So it's just it's an easy way for physicians to kind of gauge instead of trying to, you know, yeah. to do it in their head, yeah. essentially. But it's, we give you all the background information so you know exactly what moved. Right? So when do you think this will be? So right now, uh, up to this point, clinics that are using this test are part of the registry, mm -hmm. right? When do you think it will be, the test will be more widely available for people who want to get the test? Because right now people can't go, it's not direct to consumer, they can't just go order it. I don't I don't think it will be direct to consumer because again, you have to interpret, you have to, you sure. have to. Sure, I get that. But I mean, when do you think it will be more widely available? So in a couple of months. Concierge it's, clinics. So or, yeah, so in a couple of months, it's going to be launched in 46 states. That excludes uh, Florida, New York, California, and Washington. Why Washington? You guys regulate LDTs differently. So when you do huh. work on more paperwork, so I mean, the, with the goal of bringing other states on board, but basically yeah, states where sort of they have this special regulation, that will be the next step. 
and certification for lab directors and all of that. Is, but okay, is that related to the CLIA piece? Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. got it. Yep. So that's so that's that's all there is to it. But basically, yes, we're gonna. I mean, we're gonna launch so, in as many states. So once that's done, any clinic that wants to offer this to their patients yep. Yep. would be able to do that. Yep. Can Great. just order it like you order Great. anything else. Yep. Yeah, and we'll get report and all of that. So it's sort of so it's basically would look the same. Just will actually be commercially available. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, anything we haven't talked about no. that uh, you think we? No, I see they want to set up. Okay, so we got to go, guys. We're gonna get kicked out of our space here at the lovely Mayflower Hotel. Thank you for joining. As always, if you have any comments or questions, please post them below. And I hope to see you next time on the Optispan podcast.